Hello, welcome. My name is Kate Valentine. I'm founder of Singing Mama's Choir and I'm delighted to be interviewing today one of our very own Singing Mama's Choir leaders, Zoe Kennedy. Um, and you may have come across Zoe before. She has many talents. She's quite a creative. We've got um, just on the list, actor, singer, songwriter, um, artistic direct director, writer, poet, mum, puppeteer, storyteller, artist. Did I miss any more? Probably. I don't know. I, I lose track myself, to be honest. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. My pleasure. So are you happy if we just dive into some questions? We'd love to know about your work in uh, song composition. Yeah, do it. Okay, so I've done quite a few of these interviews now. And what, where it gets really interesting is to find out about the person. And so would you mind just thinking about the first time you wrote a song? Hmm. It's, it's quite a specific one. So I do, I do actually remember, um, partly because of the journey that I've had with music being it's the thing that somebody else does because I play a bit of piano, I play a bit of flute, but nothing incredibly proficient. So a musician was a title that I was, um, I, yeah, I, I saw as being somebody else. And so I do remember when I wrote the first song because I remember the feeling of, do I have a right to do this? <laughs> you know, that, 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 just that inner critic. Um, but I was on a creative artist workshop um, in, where was I? In Penzance, actually, in Cornwall. And I wrote this song, I had my flute with me, and it just kind of came and wouldn't go away. So I had to write it down and create a piece about it, um, which, which I did like it, when I was eight and a half months pregnant with both with each of my kids, we used the song as part of a performance art piece about postnatal depression. Um, oh, so the song was called Baby Blues, and was, uh, yeah, so it got it got used and seen and and worked with. What kind of life phase were you in at this point when you wrote the song? Um, when I wrote the song, uh, yeah, definitely not not children on the horizon at all. It just it just came when and sometimes songs or poems or things do that they just arrive and they won't leave you alone okay so you're, on a you're on a creative writing retreat you're you're adult now you're you're yeah yeah, yeah it was uh 2010 okay not that long ago um, and, were you, and so you're playing on your flute and were you trying to write a song no not really um the the work that i do with this this particular um there's these these people uh, called P uh, Paula Hotel and Nancy Spanier are like my creative mentors, and um, she used to run the Nancy Spanier Dance Theatre of Colorado. And he is uh, a creative magician. He just he just pulls the creativity out of people and and helps you get rid of the blocks. And so he works with people in in music, dance, performance work, um, uh, visual arts, poetry, any any kind of creative medium. And you come together in a really intensive week, either in France or Scotland or in Cornwall, and just work really intensively. And he's like this incredible shapeshifter that helps you okay. kind of get whatever you need. That's that, that yeah. the space. You're in that space, and you're so you're away from your normal life, and then you're just playing on the. Tell me what happened. How did that? How did the song arrive? Um, it's the the tune. The tune came first and I was just humming it over and over. And actually, you, the, now you've said that, that really rings a bell of going, I was away from my normal life. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of my songs, like two years ago, I started to do solo retreats. And two of my favorite songs were from each of those two retreats that they, that I just, when you are able to push everything else to one side, and like you said, I have quite a lot of other yeah. things <laughs> demanding attention. Yeah. Um, the first thing that floods in is music. Okay. And so when you say solo retreat, you mean you're completely on your own for a number of days or? Um, the first one was for my 40th birthday and it was, um, yeah, me in a cabin in a mountainside in Spain and nobody and nothing for two miles. <laughs> <gasps> it was amazing. It was really good. <laughs> yeah, challenging. Songs came then? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. And also a few of the songs that I already taught in my choirs and stuff just followed me there. Two in particular that, that I just found myself singing every single day. Okay. Um, but yeah. So we'll come back to that. Zoe is a little one. What Was there singing and music alive for you as a child? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, my dad sings. Um, he used to sing in a band when he was young. And What does um, he sing? 
that. What does he sing? What does he sing? Anything and everything. <laughs> he's always singing. When he's cooking, he's singing like the whole street could hear him singing. It's it, he's got a great voice as well, which is which is good. But whenever, because um, my mum and dad went together, we used to go backwards and forwards to Manchester, um, and and the whole journey pretty much there and back would just be singing. And years later, one of my best friends from school went on holiday with us, and she said it was like going on holiday with the Von Trapp family singers. <laughs> so there was a lot of singing. When you say you're singing anything and everything, give us some ideas. What kind of things would you sing together? Um, some of the things Dad used to rewrite lyrics to, and uh, they'd be quite funny. There's one particular one that I actually performed in, at a hotel in India this, last year um, called the, When the Queen She Came to Manchester, which was about um, her having a, an underwear malfunction at a, at a function. <laughs> so it can be anything from that, but also lots of Irish folk songs. Um, and things like Yellow Bird, some stuff from the charts, um, yeah, lots of different things. Occasionally some African songs because my parents visited Kenya when I was very small. And actually the last three weeks in my online choir, we've been doing a song that they brought back from Kenya. And um, because my mum and my dad both come to my evening choir, now we're on Zoom, they can. Yeah. And so we, we sang Malaika and we, everyone loved it. So we've done it for three weeks in a row, which I very rarely do, but. You were also sung world music as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Did you and consider that to be a normal experience for people? Like you, you said, your friend commented that that was like the Vaughan Trap family. Did you realize that that was not everyone's experience having singing so alive? Yeah, I guess so. But uh, in terms of the world music that felt very um, connected to their trip. So they, we knew that they were going to this really exciting place and we weren't going with them. And so when they came back, we just soaked up everything. Um, we were just so intrigued. What was it thing. like hearing those songs? Oh, amazing. Amazing. And I, like, I remember them now. I sat down to learn Malaika and I was like, I already know it. Like, I remembered all the African words and I must have been, I don't know. I have no idea how old I actually was. Probably about three, four, maybe even younger. Wow. So yeah, they, they dig deep. <laughs> and were you sung to to sleep as a child? Do you remember that? I don't remember that. My my mum's not a singer, um, but which is why it's so lovely that she's been in an online choir. She wouldn't go to a choir normally, um, except for when she comes to visit and I uh, and she comes to singing mamas and she says she's going to come just to listen and I tell her that ain't an option. <laughs> so she just was, it, was it that your mum wasn't sung to also do you think? Do, do you know about that? Maybe, I don't, I, I never heard my grand sing. Mm. I remember dancing around the sitting room to Julia Iglesias with her but I don't ever remember her singing. <laughs> okay, um, tell us, tell us. Um, okay, well that's, that's a, a lovely clear line there for your mm. dad and I can see when you describe him and you talk about him, I can see threads in your work. If you go and look at Zoe, Zoe's uh, website, which the links are below, um, you, can, you can explore the YouTube page and I can, I think there's an echo of certainly the creative um, and the comedic there. Um, but if you tell us, um, so what was your route into, just to deviate a little, what was your route into the acting world? Oh. I did National Youth Theatre when I was a kid. Um, so my summers were spent down in London doing professional productions. Um, but I was really academic. Like I, I got the internal scholarships through my school, through through the whole way through. And somewhere I have 13 GCSEs, three A-levels and a degree. And I'm <laughs> really handy. Um, and those in music? Did you nope. study music? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> Never formally studied music? No, only um, a few singing lessons. I'd, I've done a few piano lessons and my flute lessons, but my flute lessons were actually only when I was nine and 10 and then I gave it up. And then years later, I was sent for an audition um, for a, a musical version of the Canterbury Tales. And they said they wanted actor musicians. And my agent must have, have read somewhere that I learned flute at school and she just told them I could play. <laughs> And so she said, oh, they really want to see you, but you have to take your flute. I was like, what flute? I don't have a flute. And so I went to Moss Side in Manchester and, and uh, bought a very cheap flute and learned to play while my guitar gently weeps and went to the audition. Oh, and I got the job on the condition I practiced more. Well, that's, that's that. I think knowing you, Zoe, that speaks a lot for, for who you are. I mean, yeah, well done. 
<laughs> literally nothing you won't try. I, think. I didn't actually end up playing the flute in that show. I learned the penny whistle for it and I did a lot of harmony singing, but yeah, it was uh... amazing. <laughs> and um, so if anyone's watching this and they think they recognise you, it might be because they've seen you before on telly. Yeah, I've done loads of telly stuff, but yeah. three kids, um, most of my work was touring theatre and big TV shows um, and lots of episodic stuff like other usuals, your Holby Cities and your Doctors. I've been three very different characters in Doctors over the years, from a pregnant vicar's wife to a um, self-harming weather girl at one point. And then somebody that was a, a hit and run, um, she'd done a hit and run and was on, uh, on community service and, and stole some money, I think. I can't remember, it was years ago. But yeah, lots of episodic stuff that's quite random. Um, and then I played staff nurse Meryl Taylor in the Royal for five series. So that was that was. I, like, would, you know, I would love to delve into the acting world, but what I'm interested. It's hilarious! In, I look about twelve. <laughs> well, you did just reveal your age about five minutes ago, and I'm kind of glad you did because you look you don't look a day over thirty, but you are actually quite a mature woman. In, yes, in, I'm forty three this year. <laughs> I don't no. know what your secret is. Anyway, tell me more about um, your choir work. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, my choir work is not something I necessarily ever thought I could do. It was always, I, I, I liked singing in school and I was in the kind of, I went to school in South Wales. So in terms of a tradition where singing and poetry is part of the, the air that you breathe, um, we had the Eisteddfod every year. And so we'd always sing for that. And you can tell I went to school in South Wales for the way I said Eisteddfod every year. <laughs> it crops up sometimes. But um yeah, so I'd sing, I sang in choirs, but never saw that as something that I would, I could possibly lead because of the whole musician thing. Um, and then I met you, <laughs> is basically what happened. Um, I, I, I went on to the Singing Mama's Choir website and I saw that you were what I thought said Forest Hill. And I really needed to sing. I really, really needed to sing. And I'd had, I, I'd gone through the, um, the early years with my first and with, had my second and was just really needing that. And so I messaged you going, oh my God, I think I might be able to get to school pickup if I'm if I'm quick, could I come? And you said, yes, there's one space. And then and then I looked again and it said Forest Row. And I was like, oh, I can't <laughs> get to school in time for Forest Row. But then the dialogue was open and I came and trained with Singing Mamas. And that was that has been just so glorious for me because it has um, really transformed my relationship with my voice and with myself and with music altogether because I was coming at it from a totally different angle and it wasn't the academic proficiency thing where in order to shine and be good at that you've got to be really really good at it and it's and it's a you can get it right you can get it wrong kind of scenario um, whereas coming at it from a natural voice network I still have it come up every now and then of, of, of it bubbling up but but I really believe it when I say that every voice counts and that um, that I love that a load of people that come to my choirs were kicked out of their school choir when they were eight and they, they've been told not to sing. And, oh, it makes my blood boil. And I'm like, right, we'll sort that out. <laughs> and so it's just amazing to watch people's journey with it. And, and it feels like my journey very much echoed that. But as you know me quite well, and as I probably proved through the story I've already told, my, my way of dealing with the, I can't do this, I'm no good at this music thing, because I'm married to a composer, you know, so he, he does that. Um, so my way of doing it is a little bit fake it till you make it and go, well, the only way I can do this is if I lead, because then I have to pretend I know what I'm doing and, and just like push down the insecurity kind of, yeah, and, and just kind of grab it and run with it. Which, what, um, I heard there, what I heard then, Zoe, is that you, you actually, um, a, bit, a bit like me really, you, you wanted this so much, but when you realised it didn't exist in your area, you just thought, well, I'll better start it then. Yeah. And essentially that's what you've done in order to create what you want and what you need. But this, this imposter syndrome that you just described there, this, well, I can't remember how you just described that, that no one will know or something about not getting found out um, as a leader. Um, I, I, How you just described that just then? It was, um, they won't know I'm doing it properly. Did you just say something like that? They won't know I'm not doing it properly. You said something along those lines. <laughs> but, yeah, having to fake it till you make it and pretend, um, pretend that you know what you're doing. Because, yeah. Yeah. because most of the time you do. 
it's just the self-critical voice that shuts that down mm -hmm. and if you can like put that in a box even for a little while even just to kind of step up and be brave and pretend you know what you're doing you suddenly find that you do yeah. and and the journey into to choir leading but also into writing has been exactly the same it's just been so gentle and and so like I do it at the level that I feel comfortable doing it and because I know myself and as soon as I get there I will stretch myself further but I'm not reaching over here I'm just keeping it close and keeping it uh, heart-led it's it's you've got this kind of thing going on haven't you you want to you really are someone that will and does want to challenge yourself and you've got this the the, the inner critic that you're battling mm. um but you've got this strong desire to do um to compose songs and i tell me about your tell me about that desire to compose songs how how did that come about and when and what were the what was the situation around that I think, I think it's a combination of, of things like the Baby Blues song um, was a really specific project um, and was delving into that and looking at all different ways of, of doing it creatively. Um, so I was painting and I was writing and I was doing all sorts of things. So song was, was part of that. Um, and I'd written loads of songs but never put music to them because musician over there. Uh -huh. um, and so I'd written quite a lot of stuff when I was writing poetry. Um, and then when Baby Blues happened... I just really fell in love with it. I was just, I just went, oh, I'd actually like what I wrote. And, and it was a really powerful piece. It was quite full on. <laughs> um, and, and it, but it really moved people. And it, and it, so this is a, a theater piece that you put to the music that you'd written before. Is that right? Yeah. The yeah. And then I had an artist painting live um, on, on my belly, my hugely pregnant belly with a projector. Um, yeah, it was. It's it's quite a moving piece, and so it, I, yeah, and because the song was part of a bigger project, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit like like even me as a singer before I started choir leading and had to get over myself. Me as a singer was very much if you cast me in a musical, I'll do that, but I would never say I'm a singer, yeah. and so all oh, that's gone out the window now. I do all sorts of stuff <laughs> because the choir leader side of it has just opened up my voice in the, and I'm singing every day and running choirs three times a week and twice a week even in lockdown um it's just part of the air we breathe and because I'm married to a composer and our kids sing my youngest came to every singing mama's choir that I ran for the first year and then one a week after that for his for, for the second year of me doing it so he knows all of the parts as you witnessed when uh, we, would, we had a, a leaders meeting recently and, and we'd all had kind of had this big like, discussion and Kate went, so has anybody got a song? And he's four and piped up, I have! And everyone was like, um! And he stepped into the middle and led Rowley Glathlack Mandela in four parts, didn't he? Yeah, three parts. And, and, and he's surrounded by singing all the yeah, time. Yeah, amazing pitch. <laughs> Incredible pitch. Yeah. So... Then more recently, songs have started to come out a bit more, but I'm still, I hope you don't mind me saying this, I'm still hearing from you a little bit of this, you know, um, this thing that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, um, you know, am I a musician? Yeah. You know, is that still something that you're feeling a bit of? Um, not so much now, but I'm also, um, there's levels of it, isn't there? So I'm, I'm just now... Um, being quite protective of it. It's something that I've not, I, like, I, it was a quite a slow burn with writing, and I'm writing a lot more now. Um, the last two years, um, I've been writing more. Um, but it was a slow burn, and it's like anything that's newborn, you've got to look after it, haven't you? <laughs> and so I don't want that voice getting at that. It's, it's important and needs to be protected a little bit. So... Um, so yeah, occasionally it crops up when I'm trying to get a harmony and and someone will notice something that doesn't quite go. I'll be like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And it kind of back down a bit. But I'm trying to just be gentle with it and allow that to happen and then go, oh, it's okay. It's like you, when you're happy with it, it will go out into the world. And even then, I, I test things out on my choirs and and then after they've done the song and go, I love that. I go, I wrote that. <laughs> and it's... Ah, so you say after you've taught. So not now, but to start with, I did. To start with. Okay, what's it like when you, for the first time, put your song out there to a choir and, and 
hear it back what's that what's that experience oh nerve-wracking and also quite hard to teach because you've heard so many versions of, <laughs> of it that I'm actually they're going which one did I end up with <laughs> and and so a lot harder to remember and pitch than learning somebody else's song and and then you just hear what you're supposed to hear and and you just roll with it because you don't have 10 other versions in your head um so yeah tricky to teach but so amazing hearing it in multiple voices yeah. And actually, some of them are in response to my choir. There's one that I wrote that we did at our winter sing at the end of last year called Moon Kissed, which is probably one of my favourites. And it was purely because we'd done all these seasonal songs for spring and summer. There weren't, all the winter songs were, um, I was doing a lot of, of, one, of songs that are from our land and like trying to reconnect us with our land mm -hmm. and just went yeah that's been really great but they're really quite depressing <laughs> because it's winter and it's the UK and so there's a lot of like going down and being very um lots of minor key and you know the, and they're beautiful beautiful songs but when you've been doing a lot of them it can <laughs> it can get a bit full on so somebody said well if, we, if it's going to be like that can it not be a bit bluesy and so I wrote this this song um, but it's about the light of the moon kissing the earth and sucking the warmth from the earth. So it's quite a sexy song. And it went down a storm. Give us a little demo. Oh, God. <laughs> it needs all four parts. So each one is quite simple on its own. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's like three parts that back it up with uh, the moon, the light of the moon, the moon, the light of the moon. Snow shines bright on a moonlit night. Suck the warmth from all the earth, even as you kiss it. And then there's like two other parts go <laughs> at oh, the end, and wow. it really drowned. And there's there's verses and stuff as well, but how, how it's, really, it's really funky and. Um, mm -hmm. But it, that, that was literally kind of a commission from one of my choirs. She went, I want to sing a song that sounds like this. And I didn't know one, so I wrote it. <laughs> well, okay. How did you set about writing it? I just sat down and played with my loop station. <laughs> I love my loop station. It's so good. It's so not it's like, strictly mine. It's ours. It's our, our loop station. It's the family it, loop station. It, well, it sounds very playful. So are you, are, is, it the, is there a real playful energy with which you write your songs? Yeah, very much. And like the loop station is accessible to all the family. So Cassidy is, is just about to turn five and he will spend ages on it. And he knows like where the beats are and he'll like use the microphone and change things up. And it gets, a, it gets quite full on after a little while, but it's, like you watch that and go, ah, oh, okay, that's that's how you do it. Mm. It's not. I, I battled with it to start with because of the the the, the thing mm. um, of going oh music music because you've got to be really precise with timing. Whereas like if I can do one of my songs into the loop station, I can do it anywhere because it has to be bang on timing. You have to keep pitch because when it loops back round, you're back in at the pitch you started, and if you've changed on route, it really shows up. Would you recommend that as a tool for beginners? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's an app that you can get on your phone called Loopy HD, which I use a lot because a lot of my stuff I write when I'm out and about because, like you say, it's when you have space. And when I'm at home, quite often I don't have space. Um, so quite often in my car, I'll just stick voice memo on and, and, and write something. Or my best friend had a baby on Saturday. And so as soon as I got the text, I went and sat in the garden and just turned the memo on on my phone and I wrote him a song. Um, yeah, I wrote the little boy's okay, song. Tell us about that little song that you wrote for the new baby. What did it feel like when you were when you when the song arrives? Does it carry with it a sensation, or how would you describe the feeling? Do you know it's very much like with the storytelling I do because the storytelling I do is improvised healing storytelling. So we take what people need mm -hmm. and then we get out of the way and we pull down whatever story is supposed to come in order to serve what people need. And it's like that when the when it's really working well with my songs, it's exactly the same. I have to get out of the way. And so I literally just sat and turned my thing on and just waited and then opened my mouth and that's what came out. And I've not changed anything from exactly what I sang into the... I mean, what, how you describe that sounds very easy. But how do you... I mean, if someone's watched this and thinks, okay, how do I pull down a song? How do I step out of my way? Like, 
is there anything that you can you can describe or, or like how does that it sounds like magic it is it's very well practiced magic because the like the storytelling thing we 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 tell as part of the moon cycle tales even in lockdown every week and we've been doing it for seven years and you know okay. it's very well practiced magic um so it's using the same techniques but even if you don't have that I think that playful is is the way in right. of just literally if you've got a loop station just like find before you try and put words or try and like make 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 your perfect song no such thing you could just kind of mess around and go do 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 and then let that loop round and just listen to it and have a little groove with it and then do something else over the top of it and if you like it hit hit the next layer and then just do that and let them build up I mean, quite a lot of mine that I don't actually turn into songs end up with like 12 different loops going on and just me grooving around. <laughs> this really does sound like a lot of play happens in your home. Yeah. Where this creativity comes from. And it, it's reminding me of earlier in the conversation when you talked about your drives, was it between South Wales and Manchester yeah. um, with your dad singing and, and making things up? So that's, is it more, more of that kind of energy, that play energy? Yeah, sometimes. But then a lot of my songs are uh, will go really in, um, mm. and they're not all all mm. bubbly. I have I have got some of those, but then some of them are, are a lot more meditative, and then it's still playful, but in a in a really really looking deep and being curious about what you find rather than judgmental. Um, so it's more of a kind of playful curiosity, but it doesn't have to be bing 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 kind of playful. Um, but if somebody was wanting to start writing. And to get to get out of their own way, as, as I kind of slightly crudely put it, and um, if a good illustration of that concept, watch um, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert did a TED talk about genius, about creative genius. Watch it. It's about uh, a creative genius being like this little um, being that that is there it's not like in you like a suffering artist if it's bad it's all your fault and you know it's it's the idea of just take absolving yourself of the responsibility enough to allow it to live mm. rather than squashing it that's a great tip i'm definitely gonna look that one up mm. and are there are any other um sort of solid inspirations that you have to draw for, for all of your work to draw on yeah you um, <laughs> Sophia F. The Mew and Susie Rowe are, are the three kind of key women with the little triumvirate of, of witches oh. <laughs> who have, um, have really just held me in my process, not just with, with writing and choir leading necessarily, but just as friends and colleagues and, and um, yeah, really inspiring people of just watching what you three do and go, <laughs> yes, more of that, please. <laughs> it's a... Uh, yeah, it's really nice to feel like it's part of a web of of song sharers and writers and and yeah, going to the Natural Voice Network, um, the annual gathering in January is the first one I've been to. And I started off with my little syndrome of sitting down and going, oh, hi, I'm Zoe. There's a massive room full of people. What's your name? And it was Helen Yeomans I was sat next to, actually. And she was like, oh, I'm Helen. And I was like, <gasps> I love your songs. And I was like, I I'm not going to say that out loud. Um, but yeah, by the end of the weekend, I wasn't like that. I just felt like I was in the circle. But And so that energy was not coming from there. It was what I'd brought in. And that weekend was really useful for me, actually, to dissolve that and to feel like the network is a real thing. And I, I already felt that within the Singing Mamas Choir Leaders Network, but Natural Voice Network as a whole and a holding. Um, yeah, it really does. It feels really nice. To break down these little um, things that we carry, that I, I I can't help but say it. The the, the phrase that that you you first invented for us in our network. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to say it. But... <laughs> it's so perfect. The itty bitty committee that mm. that we live with, and I'm sure everyone can relate to that. But for you, it seems like you've really practiced um addressing that facing it removing it working through it and all aspects of your creative crea creativity yeah, and it's ongoing and it's ongoing mm. yeah um and a lot of gold can come of it by the looks of it mm. yeah mm. so um 
oh I'm swimming with thoughts about your creative life because you really do have many projects on the go regularly you know it's hard to keep up with the creative projects that you you pour out and across the different activities that you do even as a family um yeah I'm missing festivals already and we wouldn't even have started them we usually do eight festivals in a year I do pop-up choirs at, at festivals getting it's one of my favorite things of the year, genuinely just standing in the middle of a clearing in a forest and kind of a hundred people rock up going, oh, I can't sing, but I'm going to give it a go. And then they all end up making this amazing sound. And if it rains, we all do this and sing rain songs. And it's just glorious. And I'm already slightly grieving for, for losing my festivals this year. But, um, but yeah, watch this space. We're coming up with some ideas as to what can be done. <laughs> we will watch this space. Um, but tell us, so if anyone hears any of your songs, I think that, that only a couple of years you've been sort of pouring out these compositions, and I'm sure there's many more to come. But if anyone hears... Make a songbook, it will be out next year. Fabulous. And in the meantime, a couple of my songs are going into the Songline songbook. So. They are. Um, but if anyone should hear via social media or see it on any of your platforms, or even in just by ear one of your songs how do they share it what should they do and how do they contact you um, my website zoe sings.com has all the different strands just for the singing thing i didn't bombard you with everything else <laughs> so just for the singing side of things it's got all the different avenues um, i started this week to write a composition page for that where people can buy individual songs if they want to to have a score and um, and I know it usually comes with MP3, but I might actually personalise a little teaching video because I like to, I like to chat, <laughs> and so it, I might send a little teaching video with with people getting it. That was next question. How do you get paid for your work? But you've just said you're creating a song composition page, so people can pay you directly for your work. Yeah, and it's it's not, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you you really do want the songs to be out there and part of this network and part of this community. And you want everybody to be singing them, but you also kind of have to eat. And so it's trying to find that balance of going, none of them are going to cost very much. But, and, and actually, it's more important that people are singing them. If they hear one round a campfire mm. I, and then find out about it and sing it and share it when you're next round a campfire. But if you want to teach it to a choir and you want the dots, then, then um, yeah. Or if you're able to, then it's always, it's always very gratefully received especially at the moment <laughs> Absolutely. yeah well it's definitely one of the missions driving these interviews so that we can really find out from different composers what their values are around sharing their music it's so easy to share music across the um, internet um, and I personally love always love sharing a story about who wrote how they wrote it why they wrote it where it, where it was born from um, as well as naming the person and directing them to their sales page if they have one yeah. um, so all the links below and you also start to build up, like as a choir leader, you build up repertoires that are people that that your choir lead, your choirs um, start to know who they are. So if I teach a, a song that Susie has, has arranged, I'm like, oh, it's her who did this and who I went to do that with. And you've heard lots about her, and you've heard lots about her dad. And I'm going to work with her again in October if if uh, yeah. if we're allowed. And and you know, so they they know who these people are. And Songline has been amazing for that as well, because I've been there going, go and see who they are. Like you'll get to you'll get to sing with them. You know, it's been really nice. A lot of people don't really understand or appreciate that the same copyright laws that are applied to the Beatles back catalogue apply to every individual that creates something, a poem, a song, a um, piece of art. Um, it's, it's little known about and it's it's. Um, musicians are often offered the chance to perform for exposure rather than than pay and this well is... for that now <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um so what what are you working on next what's the the the, mo the thing that's lighting you up at the moment Zoe? i'm really loving my online choirs it's um yeah and i'm even contemplating because it's going to be a while till we can get back together and sing like a lot of people that come to my online choir live like so far from each other that they couldn't meet and go to a choir anyway. So I've got people down in Exeter, I've got people in Scotland, I've got um, somebody in Holland, we have people in Colorado, um, <laughs> where else? Yeah, randomly, no, somebody took us for a walk on, on Ilkley Moor this week in our choir, he was up there, so he took us with us and sang on the top of the moors. And we would never get to sing together. And also lots of my singing mamas who used to sing with me during the day and can't, because um, they've gone back to work, they've come on and, and are there in the evening and a load of my family too. 
and it's just been like last week somebody put a little message in the chat go, uh, saying hi to everyone because they just arrived and going oh this is like my second family and somebody else was like I feel like that as well and it's just um yeah it feels really important it yeah. feels really nice well who knew that that this lockdown were, and zoom could provide this kind of connection but it really has yeah mm. So yeah, and it's also getting me to be a bit more brave because like, for example, my choir next week that I'm running, I've committed to doing only my songs. And so whilst I've slipped a couple under the radar in my choir sessions so far, next week I'm, I'm kind of doing, and it, and it made me sit down, partly because we're doing this and that made me sit down and look at my catalogue and sort out my website and put the composition stuff on it for a start. Um, but also sat down and went, I've got more than an hour's worth of material I'm gonna to have to choose which songs I want I want to go in in this and that felt really nice in the same way as when I first did the website I went from going what is it that I do to going oh that that's what I do <laughs> um so it's it's a similar kind of journey well, but yeah, yeah and I've obviously got a whole load of other projects going on the, into the challenge and giving so much of yourself and so much of your talents to others and so really what's kind of what I'm curious about is where do you find all your energy from Zoe? What gives you energy for all this creative work and also being a busy mum? Good question. I think, do you know, I think that a lot of it is quite ingrained uh, of, a, of a kind of a work ethic mm -hmm. um, and when you choose a creative industry the, it comes with a lot of judgment of especially if like, I was an actor for so long it comes with a lot of oh, so you're, you're going to be out of work for how much of the time kind of that, that comes with it. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of the drive is, is uh, it used to be kind of proving myself. Um, and so now it's not so much that it's, but and it's partly habit and partly excitement. It really drives me when I've got a project and, and can kind of see it into fruition or a challenge like the singing thing. I didn't envisage at any, mo any moment when I started doing the Singing Mama's Choirs that I would be where I am now, where I'm writing and running multiple choirs. And I was in India singing for Christmas and New Year last year. I was in the Maldives this New Year, just gone singing. And, you know, I just would never have said that that would be a thing that I would be doing. But it's, it's really nice to lean into something and not know where it will take you. Um, I, yeah, I think maybe it's just the fact that I don't like routine and, and to be able to look forward and see everything <laughs> the way it will be. So I'm like, okay, shake that up. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm astonished at how much you do achieve and, how, and like I said, how much you do give to people and you're just such a generous spirit. And if anyone's watching this thinking, how, how am I going to work with this woman? There are many ways you can work with this woman. And the door is pretty much wide open to every, everyone all the time. You seem to have something for everyone. Yeah, there's loads of different stuff that I'm doing. And, and every week, even on lockdown as well, there's choirs and the storytelling, which is um, in this, in with the cycle of the moon. So, yeah, we, we tell it new moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. And so we're just like as a group looking at the process of of like building ourselves up and then emptying out of like really getting rid of what we don't need anymore i think there's a real change about to happen um and i kind of see song and story as leading the way for it really oh, so that's very passionate is. Gosh. okay zoe i'm the keeper of time so we're gonna have to um think of a final question even though there are i've now left with more questions than <laughs> i had when i started so um maybe you could just um, speak to anyone watching this who doesn't see themselves as a creative. There's, there's many people that know they want to be creative and they'll probably be drawn to looking at things like this to, for inspiration. So if someone is at the beginning of their journey of, of whatever their art is, what advice would you give to them? Be kind to yourself. Something that's taken me quite a long time to realize that that's actually at the key of, of, um, valuing yourself and what it is that you produce um so yeah just sit with um with how you feel about it and and i guess that that kind of idea of curiosity rather than judgment mm -hmm. of just going okay you might or might not be able to pick out where that voice comes from but usually it's not yours mm -hmm. um and then when you manage to listen to it it quite often quietens enough for all these other voices so that makes me sound schizophrenic doesn't it <laughs> But just the songs have have um, have a, a, 
a clear channel to come through. Um, and I think it's the same. I, the best singing teacher I ever had um, didn't put anything on my voice. I didn't, I'd never heard a natural network at that time. But she did a workshop that we were just rolling about and like jiggling about. And for the first half of the day, we didn't sing a note. And but the voice that I had at the end of that day was unrecognizable from my own. It was just this like whoosh, incredible sound that I, I'm not sure I've ever really heard again since because I've never spent a whole half day getting there. But um, but the singing lessons I used to do with her, she she just make you really embody it. Um, rather than it being up here. I think that's the key. If you're like me and you have a very kind of academic mind or then just like finding a way to go, oh, okay, shish, <laughs> and let your heart lead a little bit. Um, but yeah, if I, like, if I had to hit a high note, she wouldn't try and make me reach up for it. She'd like creep up behind me and kick my knees away from behind when the high note was coming. So I go, ah, and she's like, see, that's higher than you needed. Bring it back down a little bit. Um, so just like that playfulness and the and the being gentle with yourself, mm -hmm. um, in whatever creative medium you're you're looking at, actually not just composition and not just singing, but if it's true, and by the way it is, that everybody has this incredible instrument and this voice, whatever yours is like, it's not like anyone else, anyone else's, then it stands to reason that everybody also has a song, and I know it's kind of a cliche that everybody has a book inside them. But I would also very strongly say that everybody has has at least one song. Mm. Oh, that's gorgeous. Zoe, thank you so much. Um, I'm just literally going to go and dive into your website now and sign up for all of your classes. <laughs> oh, I better finish the composition page. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll definitely be keeping close and, um, and talking more um, on this channel um, between us, just watching you further grow into your, into your work mm. and uh, in deep gratitude for everything you give. Right back at you. Most of what I do in terms of the singing is, um, is down to this lady. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's been a bit of a life changer for my whole family, actually, not just me. They, they live and breathe song every day. They already did with music because of my husband. But to be able to have that met from both parents is um, really, really special. Absolutely. And you are in on the mission with us. Very much so. Bring these songs into hearts and homes everywhere. So let's keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zoe. No worries. Take care. All the links below and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.